Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to Prelude, an interview series about opera produced by Atelier d'Excellence for educational purposes. The current episode is supported by the dynamic music platform at Music Matters with Jason Tram. Jason Tram participates as a guest interviewer. Today, we are hosting one of the world's most sought after coloratura sopranos, praised for the silken clarity of her voice and the needlepoint precision of her coloratura. I would add an artist that fills the place with so much joy, light and grace, soprano Miss Erin Morley. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. What a nice introduction. <laughs> and I take you exactly. in. That's so nice. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, Erin. Welcome. We are very happy to have you with us and honored. And uh, our audience is very excited too to listen to the, our conversation today. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you invited me. And I have really appreciated the, the other interviews you've done so far. So, thank oh, thank you very much for watching. So thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Sunny Boy Gladla is uh, the first who will start today with a question. My God, you just, I mean, listening to you playing the piano and your voice at the same time, my brother keeps on like, writing me, Siabong, Siabong, I'm a Congo. He says, I'm going to say to you, you don't know how many times he's watched that clip. I mean, Aww. we've been watching it for Christmas. I mean, <laughs> New Year's, we're watching you, how you play and how you end. That makes me uh, very uh, happy. Thank you. So I guess I will start with the first question. Um, you grew up in an uh, artistic environment. Your mother is also a violinist. And yeah. uh, you began your music studies, studies as a piano and also a violinist. What motivated you to turn to opera? And how did your musicianship help you as a young, as a young opera singer? Yeah, great question. I, I, I did grow up in a very musical home. Music was our love language. Um, my parents introduced me to all different um, genres of music. Um, however, I had never seen an opera until I got to college. Actually, I had I had I was exposed to singing and in in all different forms and um, and I did lots of choir when I was younger. I of course, as you mentioned, studied instruments um, and most seriously the piano. But um, I had never actually been to a full opera until I got to Eastman School of Music for my undergrad. And um, I think, you know, I was very into musical theater as, as a child. And I think I, I assumed that it was something like that. <laughs> and in fact, it is. It's, it's really not that different from musical theater. It's just a different style, right? Yeah. But what was your first opera? The first opera I saw at the Eastman School of Music was the fall opera, which was Albert Herring. <laughs> <laughs> a great show. I mean, it's like not your typical first opera, you know, the thing that like grabs you and, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, reels yeah, you yeah. in. Benjamin Britten is usually like so depressing, but, it, <laughs> but I'll say to, that again. Right? <laughs> right? I did right? 10 of this crew last night. So uh, depressing. <laughs> absolutely the most yeah. depressing repertoire out there, really. I mean, yeah. beautifully depressing. <laughs> right? I um, agree. But I loved Albert Herring. I loved mm -hmm. it, and I thought I thought it was. Um, I, I loved the music. I mm. maybe because it was in English, it was also easier for me to connect to it. But I I I loved the singers who I saw in that production. I mean, Brian Mulligan was the baritone. He was oh. Sid. You know, I, I'll never forget. Like, you know, he was the first guy I saw sing Sid. You know, and that it, it, we, I was spoiled at Eastman. I had lots of amazing colleagues there, um, who were very inspiring. And and then my my first opera that I was in was later that year. Mm -hmm. I was in the chorus of Elixir of Love. You know, I think I I just I, I turned to opera because. I had started being interested in singing. I'd started like, you know, in high school, there were there were more singing opportunities and I started to, you know, 
I started to do musicals in high school. I was in The King and I. Um, and I think I, I had, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd also, I'd heard, my parents brought home albums. Mm-hmm. You know, I had Cecilia Bartoli in the house. I had, um, I was listening to Renee Fleming. I was listening to Eva Marton. Um, and just starting to become exposed to this other style of expressing through the voice. And I really loved it. And I started to imitate it. And I started to sing along. And my mom, I think it was probably like 15 or 16. And my mom, she just, heard me in the other room like sort of singing along with Cecilia and she was like you know Erin you're actually sounding pretty good you know (laughs) Um, and so I thought maybe I should study voice and I started studying when I think I was 16 and then it was only a year of study before I went to college I thought I was going to college as a pianist I thought I was going to, you know, go on to have a performing career as a pianist and, and, um, and, you know, I, I, I threw in a voice audition at the very last minute just for the heck of it, because I thought, well, why not? So I was surprised myself. Um, the path seemed sort of laid out for me. You know, I was not really, um, seeing a lot of interest as a pianist and Mm -hmm. I was, but they were interested in me as a singer. So I, I went to Eastman as a voice major and I did study piano while I was there. Um, I had to audition to, to take lessons while I was there. And I did that and I found it to be really, uh, really interesting and educational. And I played for a lot of singers. I was an accompanist for a lot of singers. Um, and all of that really informed my singing. Everybody who, Anybody who asks me, and I have a lot of people ask me, you know, my daughter is interested in singing. Um, uh, she's like 12. I don't know what to do with her right now. You know, like, do I put her in voice lessons? And I always say, have them use this time to study an instrument yeah. or sing in a choir, right? You know, that is is really how you develop an opera singer is by studying other things before you get past puberty, I think. Yeah. Um, so I found it, 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 it was a very organic transition. Um, and I, I loved, I loved the, um, the, I got into opera more and more as I was at Eastman because I was really becoming fascinated with the element of language. You know, um, the element of storytelling that is just more overt than it is when you're playing an instrument. And, um, you know, I really immersed myself in as much language study as I could. You know, that part Mm -hmm. of it really appealed to me. So, um, yeah, at at a certain point, I had to really give up the piano. and, um, And I was glad that I had studied it as much as I did because it has served me really well. Um, you know, it, it has helped me to learn music faster. It has helped me to understand the orchestra, um, to be able to listen. I think my, my time in choir also informed those, those listening skills as a musician. Um, yeah, so I, I think if, you, if anybody is is wondering how do i build an opera singer from the ground up you know like what do i do with my three-year-old i mean just expose them to music you know um expose them to music and give them all the information that don't just put them in front of an opera album obviously it's not necessary but give them everything expose them to everything just to add on that, were you exposed in in the different languages? Because I mean, your French when you sing French is just flawless. I mean, oh, Italian is it's amazing. But I just I was wondering, did you study French? Did you study to speak the languages? Or what was next for you? What was the process? Yeah, um, when I when I was in college um, during the summers, I would I would study in 
Europe if I could. Um, I did some language programs um, and I started with Italian. Um, I did two summers in Italy and, um, you know, I had studied French and German um, and Italian in school, but there's, there's only so far that you can go before actually visiting the country and speaking with people. Um, so I just tried to get over to Europe as much as possible. And um, when I started singing internationally, I realized that was an opportunity to learn the languages as well. I think, you know, for American singers, it's very difficult to pick up language skills um, before you just are thrown out into the world of performing. It's very hard. Um, and you kind of end up learning on the job. That that I can mm -hmm. relate. That's so true. Yeah. I think for us, for us as South African as well, we had I had to study Germany when I moved to Germany, which is quite difficult in the in the beginning. Yeah. I can relate. Right. Yeah. It's like baptism by fire. You just yes. throw, <laughs> thrown into the deep end. And okay. And my first international job was um, at the Paris Opera. You know. Oh wow. And this is like before we had like you know good cell phones <laughs> yeah. and, and so i i really felt very it was very isolating you know i i had to learn fast yeah um, and i got a french tutor while i was there and um yeah you know, there you cannot overestimate how valuable things like study grants are for young singers you know i used all of the money that was given to me for those things for language study always awesome. mm -hmm. yeah you, you get a french tutor you get an italian tutor you um you go to a, a a language program and that is the bulk of what young singers have to glean when they're you know in any country i think i think especially if you're in a country that's not you know that's outside of europe it's just hard to get those skills until you go yeah amazing and i think it, what you're saying it really does resonate because we have so many young singers and some of them when you i mean when we consult to them and we try to explain that it it, it, it comes with investments you have to uh, pay you have to go for some that like for instance pay for voice lessons for for language and all this and sometimes they look at us like are you are you kidding i can just sing the score but it, it has to be in within you if you understand the language better things comes more i mean it, it gets easier and easier i think yeah i think you can get by without um without speaking the language if you work in austria you can get by without speaking german um you can get by as a singer if you don't you know, have piano and violin skills yeah. It's not that it, that will make or break you. I think it just makes it a lot easier for you to communicate with people and and to you will just develop faster and it will it will be easier for you to do well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so if much. I may if I may some point Erin, I think that singers sometimes don't understand the importance of languages. I remember when I was in the university in Munich, they had extra classes that were not obligatory for languages. And uh, let's say for friends, we were two people in this extra class. Nobody had the interest to come because they just wanted to sing well what is written in the score and didn't have any interest out of that. So that's really great. I agree with Sunny Boy to hear from your lips yeah. this kind of advice. It cannot be underestimated. It's, it's, it's very important. And I think there's a do what there's two goals, main goals for a young singer. Gain a strong technique, learn the languages. That is really it's twofold. I think, you know, I don't think young singers it, those are two very hard things to do. That takes a lot of time. Those two goals, right? Those take years to develop. But that is what will prepare you for, for a performing career and, and for the next step, right? That's where you start. Yeah. You've taken that down, Maria. <laughs> so you are so <laughs> I am writing that down because then I use it, you know, always yeah, exactly. for the quotes we put on social media. Exactly. Yes. You, you so can I'm, I'm spying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
a huge shout out to the Eastman School for starting you on that journey on your yellow brick road. Thank you so much to them for starting that pathway and um, the blessings that you've been to, to, to so many people across the world. And uh, so it's so important. And thank you for acknowledging your, your, your love of choral music and you, to get young people in there because as a conductor, to see people who understand how to be part of an ensemble, how to listen, how to sing in tune, how to be an artist, yeah. a musician is so important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is. Um, I come from, you know, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. And that is choral country. I mean, yeah. everybody is obsessed with choirs there. It's, it's really kind of great, you know, but that's part of our culture is, is singing together. It's part of this community feeling like we make music together. That's what we do. That's what we do in mm. church. That's mm. what we do at home. That's what we do as as a community. And and it's not actually, you know, there are a lot of great performers that come out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, but the focus really is on making music together. I was in an orchestra. I was in a choir. You know, my parents have been very involved in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Um, and that's part of our culture. You know, I think it's I think it's great. So you decided to stay in New York and do your master's and your artist diploma at the Juilliard School. Yeah. And you also won the Florence and Paul DeRosa Prize for Outstanding Performance. How did that environment prepare you for the international stages that you were going to take? Yeah, I mean, Juilliard was, it was, it was such a dream to go there, first of all. Um, my piano teacher had, had been a student there. She'd studied with Olga samarov stakowski um, back in the day. And she um, was one of my biggest musical influences as a young person. So I really wanted to follow in her footsteps. I didn't know I'd do it as a singer, but I was thrilled to be at Juilliard. You know, it just felt like I was being, I was, I was doing something, um, carrying her torch, you know. Um, and Juilliard being geographically situated right across the street from the Metropolitan Opera and New York Philharmonic and at that time City Opera as well. It is part of Lincoln Center, literally. And so when you go to school there, when you're a student in that environment, you feel as if you're already a working professional. You really do. And you kind of are because you know, when I was still a student at Juilliard, I was getting opportunities at Lincoln Center. I got my first big, you know, big company job at the New York City Opera. I was singing Gianetta in L'Elysir d'Amore when I was a student. I got to sing, um, you know, I was a soloist with the New York Phil in the Mahler Four um, for a young people's concert. You know, I got to do things like that when I was still a student. Um, and then when I was in the, you know, the, the, I did the masters at Juilliard and then I also did two years of the opera center and it was really a, a performance degree. And so it was two years of just getting, getting some more performance experience and getting some more language study. And it was, um, you know, it, every performance you do at Juilliard is a potential audition for the Met. And for you know the world of 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 art of the arts in New York City, so you know the the people from the Met will come across the street and they will they will watch the student performances and they will see what's going on and they're very interested in that. Um, and there's a really nice relationship between the Met and Juilliard in that way, and so that's how I got my first audition with Maestro Levine. Um, wow. I was. Uh, it was my it was my last year, and I think it was actually the last opera of of the um, of my time at Juilliard, and it was La Finta Jardiniera, and I was Sandrina, and I was I mean it was it was a great opportunity to sing that role, but then all these people from the Met came over to see it too, yeah. and so that's how I was invited to audition for the Lindemann program, and you know. Those are those are connections and opportunities that um, I I might not have had anywhere else. Yeah. Do you remember what you sang for Master Levine? 
Uh, I sang the fire aria from L'Enfant Les Sortilèges. Oh my God, that's beautiful. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and I remember he said, this is one of the greatest operas of the 20th century. Oh, um, and, uh, and then I, I also sang Sandrina. And um, I remember when I sang that aria, the turtle dove aria, the gorgeous aria. Um, I remember when I, when I sang that, I think I felt compelled to kneel down, you know, on the stage um, for the second verse. At, because that was part of the staging that I had done at Juilliard, and I just felt really comfortable doing that. It was in the muscle memory. It was <laughs> in the muscle memory, and I, I thought, I, I, I'm used to singing this verse on my knees. And so I, um, I did that in my audition, and he said, I can tell that that really grounds you when you do that. You know, I, you remember these, these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, don't, I honestly don't remember what else I sang, but I worked a lot of roles with Maestro Levine. I learned Sophie and Serbinetta, and um, I worked on Olapia. Um, what else? I mean, everything that I do now, I worked on in the Lindemann program, you know? Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, we will stay at the Met for a while. Uh, an important, <laughs> <laughs> and we Great. started with the Met and we are still there. But it's such an important theater in any case. Uh, an important milestone in your career was uh, the 2013-2014 Metropolitan Opera season, uh, where you stepped in two days before the opening to sing Sophie in the entire run of the Rosenkavalier mm -hmm. in the old Nathan Merrill production. What kind of preparation, Erin, is demanded by a young artist in order to be ready to take full advantage of such an opportunity when it arises. Yeah, so I love how you couch that. I love the way you ask that question because uh, you, when somebody has a big break, it is not because overnight they became a great artist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> overnight they learned a role. I mean, that that's a very rare occurrence. Um, when when I was called to step into that run of Rosen Cavalier, I had already covered an entire run of Rosen Cavalier in a previous season at the Met. You know, they mm -hmm. they um, they had asked me to cover Christina Schaefer and Mia Person. And this was, um, I can't remember what year that was. It was it was probably 11 or something. I think it was 2011. Um, and I got to sit in rehearsal and watch Susan Graham and Renee Fleming and Kristen Siegmundson and, you know, Christine Schaefer. You know, like, that's how I learned the role. We lost Jason. Bye, Jason. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to come back. It's very so Take the come challenge. challenges. <laughs> Story of our yes. last year, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was ready, you know, I was, I was, um, I had, I had done a, a, a bunch of rehearsal backstage. It's not the same as doing rehearsal on stage. It's not the same as singing it with the orchestra. So there were a lot of, um, you know, eight balls, let's say there were a lot of, um, question marks still, but the point is, what I'm trying to say is that a company will not, you know, put that much trust in you unless they they know you're going to deliver. And I think the preparation that I had in the Lindemann program and the amount of time I had spent studying that role, I think they knew it would be a success for me. And I think that um, everybody in that cast and and crew made it possible for me to feel at ease as much as possible they 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 were excited for me they you know alice coot was my octavian she was so helpful on stage just so supportive and warm um robin was our stage director you know she she was i had already worked with robin a lot we had a relationship and she was she was extremely helpful, gave extra time for me the day before the show. Um, the costume department, everything matters, right? The costume yeah. department was amazing. Mm 
um, that costume and that wig, you know, that fit me perfectly. And I had never done a rehearsal in them. You know, they, they were so professional about it and I just felt very supported. So, um, so it was, it was, I think the stars aligned for me to make mm. that happen, but it would not have been a success if I hadn't spent years looking through every single word in that score, you know, and, and making sure I understood that is a hard score to understand as, as a non-native, right? There's yeah. so, so much in the text that, um, that, you know, the Viennese dialect and the um, references to history that you just need to take time to understand. And, um, it, it, it takes just time, it takes time. You have to be really, really ready to jump in for stuff like that. Um, and I, I fortunately, I think it, it, the stars aligned for me. So I was lucky. Awesome. Uh, Irene, you've already touched a little bit on the young artist problem. I know also that you've trained at the Opera Theater of St. Louis as a young artist, mm -hmm. and you've also won several prizes of uh, opera competitions. What is your advice uh, to young singers regarding opera studios and competitions and also maybe being a carver in a, in a company for, for, yeah. for roles? What can you say? What's your take on that? Yeah, well, I did a few. I did a few programs. I did the Ravinia Festival, which was like all uh -huh. about song, all about song, uh -huh. um, art song. And then I did also Wolf Trap. Wolf Trap was, a, was, I did two summers. It was a great program for young artists um, and is still. And um, in Opera Theater of St. Louis, I did two summers there as well. You know, I did a lot of time in the, in the young artist zone. And I think, I think it all um, helped to build my skills on the stage, you know. Um, what I would say about competitions and 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 young artist programs is that they can be an incredible vehicle for a young singer. They don't have to be the thing that propels you, but they can be. Um, if you are one of those singers who's not finding a lot of success in competitions, it's really not the end of the world. You know it. Not everybody's good at auditions and competitions. You know, I never was actually, um, you know, extremely comfortable in that, in that zone. Um, I, it just seems, it seems so out of context to take an aria and sing it for four people in a theater and then, and then switch to another opera and do the same thing. It's just so unnatural. And I never really cracked the code. Um, I think maybe in my last year of auditions, I did, I did feel more at ease because I found the right arias that I could really, um, feel comfortable doing in front of anybody, but, but it takes time to find that, you know? So, um, I found that, that young artist programs were incredibly important for my journey, um, but they don't have to be what makes or breaks you for, yeah. for, you know, for a young artist who, who's not finding success. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you go that route. I've seen lots of people just find another way, you know, just skip that, that step. And, and, you know, I never heard their name in competitions, but they're fantastic <laughs> artists today. Um, I found my first manager when I was at Wolf Trap, I was singing Serbinetta. Um, and so I, I do feel like the exposure of a young artist program can be, can be wonderful. You know, I got my manager and we were together for 10 years and he was wonderful. I was Michael Bench at Cami. Um, and we, we still have a great relationship, you know, um, he did so much for me. And if, if he, if I hadn't sung Serbinetta at Wolf Trap, I probably would not have met him. Yeah. You know? Amazing. I apologize, Irene. I pronounced you like Irene. I so oh, sorry okay. for that. <laughs> sorry oh, for I the mistake. <laughs> I have to correct myself because I'm oh, used I've to Irene. So Irene, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I've heard it all. Don't worry. Somebody introduced <laughs> me uh, when I sang in church once. 
Somebody introduced me as Irwin. <laughs> <laughs> that is very I'm different. Cool with it all. It's all, it's all good. It's all good. Um, Erin, you sank again, Sophia, at the Met uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. alongside Renee Fleming and Elena Garanza in a production that was nominated for the 2019 Grammy Award for Best Opera Recording. Uh, how would you compare this experience to your first rendering of this role? And uh, what did it feel like sharing the stage with uh, such a great artist like Renee Fleming, who is one of your uh, role models as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was such a dreamy experience. It really was. And actually, I have that, that Grammy certificate right back here. I think it's this one. Wow. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. great. This is my trophy room, guys. Um, <laughs> no, um, no, it really was. It was. It was amazing to sing Zofie to Renee Fleming during her last Marshallin and Elena Garancho during her last Octavian. Really, it was just, I couldn't have picked a dreamier cast. Um, and I learned so much from those two women. Um, they were coming from a place where They've sung those roles so many times, and they understood they understood that opera in um, in very deep, meaningful ways that that I was able to to learn from. Um, and you know, I Robert Carson's production helped me to understand the opera in ways that I didn't before, uh, for sure. Um, I think the way that he updated it to the year um, that it was composed um, was extremely smart. And I think that that idea that a composer writes, uh, a composer writes stories that, that are relevant to his day, whether they're actually based in that time or not, they, their cognizance is, is still present day. And, and so I think that that really works with this piece, you know, um, the update was, was so smart for me. Um, and, and I, I think Zofie in many of the old fashioned productions, um, she can, she can turn into a little bit of a of a wilting leaf. She can turn a little bit into a damsel in distress. Um, and I think in the updated version, it allowed me to see Sophie even more as a smart girl who is actually taking control of the situation and not allowing tradition to um write her life story um and i think that you know as a as a young singer it was harder for me to see that in the score um before the carson production um you know she really is the poster child for um feminism during that era you know she's she's saying absolutely not i'm going to choose who i marry you know i'm i'm not going to just do what everyone tells me to do. Um, so I, that's a really strong moment. Um, it was a, a strong moment for me in, in my progression and my understanding of, of the role. Just to add another question on top of that, uh, mm -hmm. since you've, uh, you, I mean, talking about repeating the role, I mean, in all the roles that you've done before, do you always go back and refresh it and maybe get new ideas? Because <laughs> the tendency of the young singers today, we tend to do an opera once and then we think we know it. Yeah. Uh, what is your advice on that? Do you go back and how, 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 how do you deal with it? Yeah, well, every time I, and this might be overkill, but it's, it's what works for me. But every time I have, um, I sing another uh, performance of the same role. I spend, I spend some some good amount of time re reminding myself of, of the score, 
and getting it into my voice again. I, I mean, I, I probably have most of that opera memorized, right? But I, I don't need to, um, I don't need to spend that much time on it, but I, I like to, because I don't want it to just be the same as the last time. Like that's not interesting to me. Um, I want, you know, in order to keep myself interested, I also, I also want to find new things in the score. I want to understand it in a different way. I want to, you know, you know, understand more about what the, why the composer did this and that. Um, and I, I think one really can, because there's so much there. There's so much there. Um, so that, that's what I do to keep it interesting for me. And I think it also keeps it interesting for the audience. Awesome. Thank you very much, Erin. Yeah. Erin, uh, you managed to captivate uh, audiences in both sides of the Atlantic, from the Met and the LA Opera to the Wiener Staatsoper, Opera National de Paris and Glidermont Festival, just to mention only a few. What are the differences, according to your opinion, working in Europe and the United States in terms of working conditions, theater organization, and of course the reactions of the audience? Yeah, I mean this is this is a big question, and um, I do think there are some very key differences um, between American opera and European opera houses, and um, you know the biggest is government funding you know we um here in america don't have any government funding for for the arts it's really all donation based um and it doesn't change the work that we do but it does change um a little bit the um the uh atmosphere of the house a little bit um mm -hmm. You know, um, when I'm singing something in Vienna or Paris or Munich, I feel like the whole audience um, is at ease because they understand that this is this is something that the the whole country is supporting, and they it's part of their everyday. It's part of their culture. It's part of they they know the words. They could sing along with me. That's really, really amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, when I sing in America, I, you know, you can, you can feel that the people in the theater are really right there with you. Um, but once you step outside of the theater, you feel like, you know, okay, yeah, the arts don't matter so much to, to you know? You really feel it. Um, and and it's just it's just that juxtaposition of when I'm in Europe, I don't feel that. I feel like in my everyday life, everyone who I talk to on the street knows about the opera. Mm -hmm. It's totally extraordinary to me. Um, the pandemic, I think, has exposed that difference in a way that is really heart crushing. You know, it's 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 soul crushing to see um, how the support is, is just not the same across the ocean. You know, it's, it's, it's just a different story. Um, so it doesn't mean that my experience in the theater is any different. I still, I still you know, I, I do the same work and I feel the same camaraderie with my um, colleagues, and I um, I enjoy it no less. Um, and I think, you know, it, there's something really to be said about singing in your home country. Like I sometimes I think I might enjoy it a little more to sing in America because I feel like I'm doing something for my countrymen, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm uh, I'm educating my <laughs> my. Uh, my people about opera and I'm yeah. sharing that thing that, that is really passionate um, for me with them. Um, so it's, it's apples and oranges, you know, it's not um, better or worse. It's just, it's just, a, it's different. Yeah. 
Erin, uh, do you find that there's a difference in the taste for, about the voices between the two continents? Um, I, I haven't found, I haven't found that as much. Um, there's, there's maybe a difference in the taste of, of repertoire. Um, I think there, are, but that can go for, you can say that house to house, there's a different taste in repertoire. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I think uh, there's, it depends on the casting directors who are there. I think it depends on, you know, whether that casting director loves, you know, um, Bel Canto or whether that casting director has an agenda for pushing new opera. It really is, it's hard to say. I think it's house by house. Um, I, I do think that American audiences um, have a little bit more, because they're so exposed to musical theater, I think they have a little bit more of a taste for, um, for like streamlined voices, Stream, you know, voices that um, feel natural to them rather than produced rather than manufactured. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the layman's ear rather than maybe like a casting director's ear, right? But so, but you have a lot of, of, of um, people in the audience who are maybe there for the first time, maybe, you know, aren't so exposed to opera. And so I think for those people, the, the thing that grabs them is, does this sound like something that's familiar to me? Does this sound like like a natural voice? Does this sound like somebody who's communicating to me? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, Definitely. Like different priority. Yeah. yeah. So your three angels say yes, enjoy more when you sing at the stage and they can probably see you live there. <laughs> Yeah, my kids, my kids, um, over the past year, my kids have, have put up with a lot of uh, space sharing, let's say. <laughs> no, um, actually, my, um, my oldest has seen me perform all over Europe. She's been to a lot of my shows, um, which is great. I love that she's, she's been able to see the things that I do and see that I'm passionate about it. Um, I really hope that my, my two younger children get a chance to do that. And, and the pandemic has left me questioning whether I will ever travel with them again. You know, I, I hope that I will. I hope that I will. Um, but, um, yeah, it'll, I think it'll be a while before my kids come to Europe and see me sing something on, on the stage. So we the lost new, the new normal, right? The new normal. We're all trying to figure out what that is. We're, I think, we're all kind of trying to figure out what the next chapter will look like. Yeah, yeah. I, I think actually that the last year has, has given us a, a sense of urgency back to live theater. You know, back to the real thing. Um, I feel a sense of urgency back to you know back to performing for for people in person right I feel that for sure but I also I also hear that and feel that from the audience members um, you know there's there's something great about being able to post a video on Instagram and reach so many people that wouldn't necessarily come to the opera house there's something really great about that. Um, however, we know it's never going to replace the real thing. Yeah. And um, I feel, I hear messages and comments. I, I see them and I read them that, you know, this, vi this video is great and I appreciate it, but I can't wait to see you live again. And that, yeah. that means so much to me that people are really like looking forward <clears throat> to that day. And I think that's what tomorrow looks like. I think it's a renaissance of live theater rather than opera on video. 
Well, thank you for embracing social media because everyone who sees you on there, it's like a ray of hope when we see great artists like you on there who are putting yourself out there. It reminds us what we're looking forward to in the next chapter. Oh, thank you. Thanks for saying that. Um, I have found it to be a lifeline for me too. You know, it's my only connection to my audience right now. <laughs> and truly, yeah. that's what it is. And um, and so I I have found a lot of joy with it too. And I I'm glad to hear that it's it's um, you know making people happy. Well, don't stop. You have big fans here. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. Exactly. I uh, so, uh, since we mentioned already the three angels, you're a mother of three, mm -hmm. uh, which were born uh, while your career was blossoming all over the world. And we would like very much to ask you also as a woman, I would like to ask you, what are the challenges that a female singer has to face by choosing to combine her work with motherhood and the motherhood of three? <laughs> Do you believe that family hinders a career or does it provide and inspiration? Yeah, this is the question that I get asked the most, I think, you know, because uh, it's, for me, it's been an amazing thing to have kids while I'm performing. Um, for me, it has been the thing that provides balance. You know, everyone asks me, how do you achieve the balance and how do you, um, you know, serve both masters? Um, and it is definitely hard. I think it, you know, it's sh young artists should not be under any illusions that it's easy because if you're going to make this work, it, it, you need to understand that it is hard work and it is expensive. That can't be ignored. It is, it's expensive, right? To travel the world with three kids. It costs more for me to perform than for someone who's single, right? And doesn't have kids. It's a totally different story. <laughs> you know, the housing alone is just like, right? It just, it just costs a lot. So I will be honest and just say that. Um, but the thing that I have found um, is that what before I had kids, um, I, 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 I just, it, I had a tendency to get really too obsessed over this detail or that detail, or I, I had a tendency to get, you know, too wrapped up in, um, too far in my head. And it, you don't have time for that after kids. And it, that's the beautiful thing about about having other people to care for. You you cannot get uh, to the place where you're you're. It just it it forces you to shed the parts of you that don't need to be there. It sheds. It forces you to to lose the parts of yourself that are not serving anyone and and that includes your career right so i have found my my, my children to be uh, an incredible equalizing factor uh, uh in my life so um it, that said it's not that way for everybody you know i have very many friends who have been forced to make very hard decisions once their kids came along it became impossible for them to, to continue singing and um, it, you know, it is logistically very tricky to do both at the same time, but, um, I think, I think I've just been very lucky with, um, with my partner, you know, my husband has, uh, the kind of job that has been very flexible. Um, he's a law professor and he, you know, he can travel, um, for long periods during the year. And in normal times, you know, we would all travel together um for my jobs and he could do his work from from anywhere um you know he spent a lot of time in the library the great libraries of all these you know, european cities you know that's where he wor would work and and um and and that that has been that's just lucky you know i happened to fall in love with somebody who who whose career made sense with mine so 
a lot of things need to fall into place in order for this to, to work. Um, but it can, it can work. And, you know, a lot of uh, young female, especially singers asking me, how, how do I do this and have a family? How do you strike the balance? I think the most important message that I could send to them is you don't have to choose one or the other. You can have both to some degree. Um, and where there's a will, there's a way, you know? If you're, if you're, you and your partner are both committed to this, then you can make it happen. Can I follow up on that? Um, Please. I thank you so much for sharing that very personal and, um, and, and deep and caring story. Um, how has your family um, been a support system during the COVID period when you're performing and your traveling has slowed down? Yeah, they, they've been everything during this period. Everything. Um, and, you know, when one part of my identity feels a little bit less fulfilled, then I, I have the option of throwing myself more fully into the other identity. And that has saved me. You know, I, I have been re I've really enjoyed um, being in one place for a long time with my kids. And they've, um, they've thrived in this environment, actually. And, and I've so, too, and it's it's such a that's a silver lining in all this. That's one of the silver linings that we is. I've I have four kids, and he had to watch them. Like these incredible people are part of my life, and you know, I've I'm, it's made me kind of realize going forward that I'm going to kind of always be aware of that. Yes, yes, and I I I agree with you. I think that it has changed me and my perspective. Um, and moving forward, you know, that this is a very healthy way of living, actually. And, um, and it's been a nice, th you know, opportunity to, to have this sort of experiment. Now, I had this opportunity when I was pregnant, too. You know, when I was pregnant, um, with all three kids, I lost a lot of work. And, you know, part of that was my choice. Some of that was not my choice. Some of that just happens. Um, and you find yourself unemployed for quite a while when you're pregnant. And it's an opportunity to experience a different side of the coin. You know, you, you, you get to um, understand what it means to be um, at home working and, and juggling and, and, uh, and, and experiencing um, the, this, this different life. And so I, I already knew that I liked it. I, I really do like it. Um, um, it's not to say that it doesn't have its challenges, but um, I, I think that going forward, you know, I think that it means that we as, uh, as parents, we know better how to how to plan the things that are coming ahead. Well, you know, my schedule, as I am continuing to plan it during the pandemic, I have in mind things that I just absolutely will not miss. You know, things that my kids are doing that I, birthdays, things that I just, nope, it's a non-starter, you know? Things that like I've, I've now come to, to value even more highly than before. So, yeah. Of having raised four teenagers now, so there's certain things like, boy, I missed a lot of those dates, you know, and now, and now I'm, I think about that too. So it's, it's incredible that you have that opportunity and uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. There's some things that it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to steer back into your uh, your incredibly versatile repertoire. Um, you're just as comfortable with the coloratura repertoire in the opera stage as the concert repertoire. And you perform with so many of the elite orchestras in the world. Is there any particular style of music that you enjoy or, or performance that you remember as being some of your favorite um, concert pieces or opera pieces? What are some of your your most um, that roles that or pieces that connect with you personally? Yeah, good question. I I mean I love everything that I've that I've had the opportunity to do. I really do. Um uh you know the roles that I've done the most up until now, I've done a lot of Strauss. Um I love Sophie and Sarbinetta. I always will. Um I've loved Olympia. I always will. 
Um, I think, you know, what I latched on to as a student was um, bel canto repertoire, and I haven't had as much of an opportunity to do to do bel canto, and so a lot of the things that I'm planning in the future are bel canto, things like Donizetti um, and uh, Bellini, and you know um, roles that I learned when I was a student because they suited my voice, but I never actually had an opportunity to do them. Um, because for one reason or another, it just didn't happen. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited to get a little more into the Bacanto. Um, yeah, I, I also, you know, Mozart is a tricky thing, actually. There's, I have not actually done as much Mozart as one might think. Um, and, you know, there's, there's just, there's a lot of, um, roles like Susanna and Despina and Serlina that I learned, but that are traditionally cast, um, as a high mezzo or, um, or, a lower soprano, lower than me, um, soprano. And so... Um, I never actually had the opportunity to sing those roles, and that's okay. I, it's it's all it's all right, um, because as I've as I've studied more and more, I'm realizing that those um, those roles actually don't suit me as well as some of the higher stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean I can't sing them, and I won't someday, right? Like I might, yeah. um, but uh, I. I I have felt like with Mozart, it's a very role by role situation. Um, I love the concert arias, for instance. Like I love the um, the Mozart C minor Mass, which I was going to do in Salzburg in January. Um, that the higher stuff really really works for me and resonates with me. And I'm I have an Aspasia coming up. You know those kinds of Mozart roles. Um, and I did sing Constanza once, but I think actually um, that Blonda suits me better. So maybe someday I'd have an opportunity to sing Blonda. We don't, I don't know. But um, yeah, it's it's role by role. I um, I really am excited though to to, to discover um, just a, a broader range of repertoire as as I move into the next phase, you know, and, and part of that is also, um, more French, you know, I, um, I really love, um, French repertoire. And I think a lot of houses just ignore it. You know, I think, I think there's, there's a few like, you know, really popular French operas. And then there's so much more that people aren't doing. Um, so, I think Meyer Bear needs to have like, you know, a bigger place. Meyer Beer Resurgence. That, that sounds great. Meyer Beer Resurgence. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I have some Meyer Bear on the schedule and I'm excited about that. Um, I think pieces like Lakme need to be done. Wow. Yeah. You know, like this, you don't see so much of that, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah. Lots of ideas for the future. Can't wait for the Bel Canto chapter and all these new pieces to come out, and we'll be all we'll looking for that as you, as the as the next chapter arises. Thank you. Yeah, so looking forward to that. Just to add on that, um, do you think singing other repertoire has prepared you mentally and emotionally to be ready for the repertoire that you want to sing? Basically, uh, mainly the repertoire. The, the bel canto repertoire you're thinking of. Did you think singing other genres of music, other styles has made you, or has convinced you that you are ready for, for the bel canto? Um, yes and no. Uh -huh. You know, uh, on, on one level, I do feel like um, bel canto naturally sort of comes before Strauss. You know, it, on one level, I, I feel that way. Um, that I, I should have done more bel canto before I jumped into Strauss. But on the other hand, um, uh, there are some bel canto roles that are heavier than Strauss, the Strauss roles that I sing. 
Um, so, it, you know, I, I think everything you do can be an opportunity to to develop uh, to develop the skills that you need. Um, but um, I, I mean, bel canto is such a unique style that I think. I, I don't necessarily feel that Strauss prepared me for bel canto. You know, it's yeah, just yeah. a different animal. I think yeah. bel canto, you know, needs to be um, treated like its own thing. It really is. I mean, the recit and the style and the ornamentation, mm -hmm. and um, it is so unique, and um, it's so hard to do well. Really, <laughs> it's so true. yeah, it's so true. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as a performer, uh, your life uh, was uh, impacted by the pandemic and uh, several of your important debuts got cancelled. How did you cope with this situation as an artist and a parent? And also, what is your advice to young artists uh, to do uh, uh, in preparation for a returning into normality? Yeah. Um I was actually just talking to um, a student yesterday um, who is about to graduate um, with her master's and is is on the brink of that you know sort of bridge in her career. Right. Um, I think it is a really hard time for those for those students in that phase of their career. Um, however, I've been I have been very pleasantly surprised at, at how many creative things I've seen happening. Um, the ways in which scenes programs are starting to be done um, via video. Um, and, you know, I feel for these students quite a bit because it's a hard situation to be in. But I told this girl and I will tell everyone, you know, you are not alone. It's not as if you're falling behind. Everyone's behind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and I told her the skills that you feel like you're losing right now or that you're not developing right now, there will be a grace period after this for everybody. And I hope there is for me too. You know, um, I feel like I'm losing skills right now. I'm not singing in front of people. It's very hard to keep up everything that, that I had 15 months ago when I was performing, right? Yeah. So I hope, I would expect that there be a grace period for everybody. Um, and I told her, look, you're not even just, it's not just that you're, you're, you're not alone as a student. All students are in this boat, but all professionals are in this boat. Working professionals are in the same boat too. We are the vast majority of us uh, just just trying to not lose too many skills right now. That is the bleak truth. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if that is comforting or not, but that's I mean, I, I, I think I think that as if you if as long as you don't feel alone in the process, it, it always makes me feel better. Yeah, I don't know. So true. Yeah. I How think we have all wondered. Sorry, Jason. I just said very spontaneously that I believe we've all wondered, younger and more established people, how we go to audition after 15 months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think there there has to be. We as an industry have to decide that we are going to give everyone grace. And if if it's not a perfect performance the first time you step out again, it's okay because we're we're being very brave to do it. Yeah. We're being very brave to get out there and put ourselves out there again and do this yeah. crazy thing after sort of lying dormant for a year. It's it's yeah. it's going to be a, a transition, and we need to all decide. Critics too. Critics too. Everyone, listen to me. <laughs> we need to all decide. <laughs> Can we say also to competition people, please raise the age limit. Raise yeah. the age yes. limit, please. <laughs> yeah, those things need to happen. Those need, you know, I, I agree with you. Um, 
I just think we all need to talk about it more. We need to talk yeah. about the situation we're in and and recognize that we all feel the same way and yeah. give each other grace. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. What do you think the next day or the next chapter in the opera industry might look like as we get back to a quote unquote normal? And what changes do you think are might be positive and have come out of this period? Well, I think one of the biggest changes I've seen that is, is really exciting and wonderful is I'm seeing a more commitment to diversity in casting and um, opera administration. And I think that has been long overdue. That's that's been a problem that that has needed to be addressed for a long time. And I think we're 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 facing that at least in America. It's a big it's a big movement towards um, embracing diversity a little more. Um, so that's exciting. That's exciting to see. Um, I think and and you know I think it's it's going to be hard to say where where the next chapter post pandemic takes us. Um, I don't know. Um, I think, I think that, you know, and, and until we get there, we won't really know how the industry has changed. Um, but I, I would hope that all of the stuff we've learned during the pandemic in terms of like, you know, there's just been a very high learning curve in terms of tech, right? We've, we've all had to embrace technology a little bit more. Um, I would hope that that has maybe a, the outcome that maybe perhaps we, we, we embrace it more as artists. I think companies have been embracing tech for a while and, and artists have been a little bit more resistant to it. And I think that, uh, I think post pandemic artists will now see the value of it. I I'm speaking for myself, you know, sure. I have, I have felt a little bit conflicted about things like HD broadcasts, mm -hmm. you know, does this cheapen my work? Does this really, does this change the way that I'm performing? Is it really the real thing? If I'm singing to a microphone and it's, is this really the experience? Are we, you know, however, um, Post pandemic, I am I'm really seeing how valuable that is as an element of, of the performance. Um, if we want opera to be exposed to everyone, uh, everyone to be exposed to opera, then, then this really is the way to bring it to them, right? Um, I would hope also, like as I was saying before, that we experience a, a renaissance of like really valuing the real thing, right? The in-person experience. And I feel everyone moving towards that and valuing that and wanting it so badly. So maybe we take those two things and we and we just find a way to combine them in a, in a, in a way that's, um, that, you know, maybe performers will accept a little bit more the the cameras in their faces all the time you know and it's it's annoying but maybe we have to accept that embrace that a little bit more and um and and maybe also the audience will um if they are available and able they they need to come to the theater like we need to really get that message out there that if if it's a possibility for you i think they will understand that it's far superior to be out of your house and in the theater, hearing the sounds unfettered and not via Zoom, right? The glorious <laughs> majesty of the unamplified human artist, right? The, the in-person experience, nothing like it. Nothing yeah. like it. Indeed. Thank you. And let's keep your, um, your opinion. Well, you said before that we'll probably have a renaissance of the arts after this bad period and uh, this will bring a lot of jobs for the artists and uh, because the artists have faced a lot of hardships, some of them have uh, also to bring bread on the table, they are not also established so they have families to take care of and some situations together with the loss were very very bad so let's hope that things will get better 
Yeah. And uh, we will have a better world with more solidarity and more understanding of each other, less competition <laughs> yes. in the future. Yes, I hope that all those things happen. I I feel that within myself, and if and if I'm feeling it, then I'm, I'm sure other people are too. You know, so let's let's move in that direction. Thank you very much, Erin. We enjoyed very much the conversation today. It was a great honor for Prelude to have you. Thank you. And uh, I think for all of us, it was a fulfillment of a dream to get to know you because we admire you very much. Oh, thank you. And uh, we would also like to thank your management for helping us realize this event today. MW Management, Miss Maria Mott and her assistant. And uh, I would like to, to thank my, my colleagues today, Mrs. Sunny Boyd Ladla and Maestro Jason Tram for uh, participating in this conversation and uh, giving this to the point questions to you. So I would like also to, add, to thank our audience for their attendance. They are wonderful. They are always here and they are writing comments of love to you. Oh, and uh, it's great. So thank you very much once more. We're going to end with uh, a homemade video that you made during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and from the wonderful place of your home and uh, if you would like can you share please a little bit about this uh, piece that we are going to hear yeah yes please so um first of all thank you for having me it's been an honor to speak with you today and thank you for giving me this platform to to share these thoughts um this song is called uh little lamb and it was written by Ralph Woodward Jr. He is um, a friend of mine. And he's also the founder and director of the Salt Lake Children's Choir, which was, as we were talking about before, I was involved in a lot of choirs when I was younger. And this was, um, this was my favorite choir. This was the, uh, a wonderful, marvelous experience to be in this choir as a child and a young person. And, um, and, and I learned so much from, from Mr. Woodward. <laughs> um, <laughs> Woodward. And, um, and he wrote so much music for us to sing. Um, uh, probably half of our program was um, his original compositions or his arrangements. Um, maybe more than half of our programs. Um, so um, this was just one of the many, many gems that he wrote. And I have programmed this song and others on recitals that I'm that I'm doing. Um, and I think I'm actually going to be singing this one in my uh, recital in Paris in May. Oh, nice. Um, I think it's on the program, yeah. So this is Little Lamb by Ralph Woodward Jr. Very nice. Before we hear it, we wish you continued success in your life and career and uh, to be very soon back on stage. We need you. The world needs you. Goodbye. Goodbye to our audience. Thank you, Jason, Sunny Boy. And let's go to the beautiful song. For us in the panel, we hear the song and we stay here. We don't leave. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>